Hello traders, it's Saturday, October the 22nd. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com, here to give you a market wrap-up for this past week, and more importantly, and all for what we can expect in the week ahead. Well, we're looking at one of the most impressive moves to jumpstart our new trading week. It would be the and remarkable climb uh, that we have from the dollar. All right. And a lot of uh, headline space has been dedicated this past week uh, to its remarkable advance. And a lot of general speculation and uh, I've seen surface level analysis that this is a move uh, that is indicative of expectations for the Fed. A Fed rate hike in December, because I think very few are actually expecting November, uh, is, is capturing the tension, and I think that reasonably uh, it is an expectation that uh, has good fundamental uh, basis. All right, but I can't say that I expect that it's one of the key drivers for what we're seeing now. Here's the probabilities of a rate. Uh, change uh, by the December 14th meeting. The gray is an expectation that it, it passes unchanged. As you can see, that is a probability that is only around uh, 32%. The balance is a rate hike, although I do think that the uh, unusual uh, pricing of the uh, instrument uh, owes itself to an unrealistic 50 basis point forecast. It is a approximately 66 or two-thirds probability uh, that the Fed does hike, and it has been for a couple of weeks. So this is not anything new. It is certainly hawkish, and seeing where the Fed stands on uh, the spectrum does convey strength to the dollar. But remember, it's a movement on the on this scale. All right, it's a change in those expectations, which motivates a change in capital and thereby movement in the exchange rate and movement in assets. That really haven't changed. I think it's not really uh, the source of the greenback strength in those interest rate expectations that are be, uh, being touted. And it, it should surprise no one because the, the event risk that we had this past week, the Fed speak that we had this past week, really didn't uh, contribute much to any change in those views. I think we can really ascertain what has driven the dollar. Obviously it was not risk trends uh, and we're not returning to this as an outright safe haven because we really don't have the pressure uh, to motivate that kind of flight to quality. As can clearly be seen in this remarkably quiet and complacent S&P 500 which we will come back to. So if this is not a uh, interest rate forecast motivation, if this is not a risk motivation, what is driving this incredibly uh, impressive dollar-based move? And for those that just say, it doesn't matter, it's price action. Well, it does matter if you expect it to continue. And the reason that I am very dubious of this continuing and why I've not really participated in this dollar rally this past week is because it is motivated from a, a cumulative crosswind uh, or secondary nature. A lot of it has been dedicated through the Euro USD drop, uh, which the Euro has been far more active uh, thanks to the expectations surrounding the ECB's uh, decision that came and went without a taper. The taper, if it were uh, announced or not even not doesn't even need to be implemented. You remember the taper tantrum of 2013 from the Fed. You just tell the market that it's going to happen in the foreseeable future, and the euro would have taken off. That would have been bullish. This being the most liquid FX pair in the world, it would have in turn most likely sunk the dollar. But instead, it is allowed to continue. Uh, however, it's really difficult to just keep the euro tumbling. Uh, not that it doesn't have its fundamental troubles, uh, amongst them the uh, its own issues with the Brexit, because uh, it's trying to, desperately to prevent others from following the UK out of the European Union. We also have unstable growth forecasts and the like, uh, but none of this is necessarily immediate and, and, and needing a uh, discount here and now from current price. 
So this may continue, but there's nothing that really is pressing it, and I would think that it has a much easier time of stalling out and stabilizing than just continuing to run. But let's look at some of the other uh, dollar-based crosses. How about the pound dollar? It's, that was one of the most remarkable through the beginning of October, but as you can see, it turned to consolidation this past week. So not a lot of dollar strength there, and it's not like the pound is putting up a big front uh, to offset any greenback effort. Uh, the dollar yen. It was doing quite well through the end of September, beginning of October, first couple of days of October, and you can see it turned to congestion as well. Aussie USD, very volatile, uh, back and forth, some strong uh, close to the week, but that was the motivation of an Aussie dollar dropping with those Aussie employment figures, which we talked about, and why I didn't want to trade the Aussie dollar breakout to the upside. Kiwi USD is much the same. Uh, this one has been very volatile, and I dedicated a strategy video to, this pa to these two currencies this past week uh, that is more uh, dedicated to uh, the fact that there is a big swing in activity in carry trade. Uh, I did show the uh, carry trade ETF versus uh, the Kiwi dollar and versus other risk-oriented assets like the S&P 500, and it's doing quite well. But we also have a dollar performance rising in the commodity sector. All right, let's turn that off. Um, actually, let's do one better. We'll actually put an overlay of the dollar. All right, the dollar has taken advantage of a drop in gold, although it has stabilized recently, and it's also seen something of a weekend uh, pullback uh, in oil, although not much conviction there, so don't uh, take these to be the proactive drivers either. All right, now if commodities were to sink uniformly, that would benefit the pricing instrument, the dollar, uh, but as you can see, it's more consolidation for oil and gold uh, as of late than it is proactive motivation. So where is most of this movement coming from? Well, it was heavily due to the Euro USD, uh, and there is a little bit of side contribution from some of the high yield Aussie and Kiwi uh, dollar crosses, but not much more than that. So the dollar still isn't in control of its own destiny, and that's not something that uh, promotes good trade opportunity. Uh, certainly, if you're just squatting on the dollar yen or a pound dollar, expecting a dollar breakout because it's going to follow what the euro euro USD or the dollar index is doing, uh, obviously it's been a frustrating period. This is why it's important to look for the fundamental motivation. Uh, and for the dollar in the coming week, there are some things that I do think uh, deserve our attention. I would say the Fed speak, and there's plenty of it uh, populated throughout the week. All right, starting off Monday, starting off very early. The Consumer Confidence Report from the Conference Board has a lot of subcomponents, which are very important to rate forecasting, but uh, we'll see if that can actually generate the kind of traction we'd be looking for. Uh, the event risk that truly, from uh, the dollar's perspective specifically, has potential is U.S. GDP. If there is going to be a serious... Uh, curb to interest rate expectations. Uh, one thing that can do it is the upcoming election on November the 8th, uh, if it turns out to be an event that the market takes poorly regardless of the outcome, uh, that could be very disruptive. But so too can a troubled third quarter GDP. A disappointing third quarter GDP would certainly curb those rate expectations if it's doing very well. It's going to make the Fed more robust, more confident in pressing forward. Not in November, at the November rate decision, but in December. All right, so that has potential, but note that it's at the very end of the trading week. So my expectations for the dollar are essentially that it's going to be pushed around by more motivated counterparts. And that's frustrating because it has been so active, especially on the index basis and the Euro, Euro USD basis. But uh, we have to put it uh, in the in the context of what has been driving it, because that is the only way that we're going to fully appreciate uh, what our next moves are going to be. 
Now outside of the dollar, uh, I've also been monitoring risk trends very regularly this past week and clearly not much going on there. Um, I put in the real-time news feed uh, a measure. This is, here we go, this range that we've seen over the past essentially three months has been extraordinarily uh, small. All right, this has been inactivity to a, a remarkable degree. So what I did was I took this range and I said, all right, what's the past, uh, since it's a longer period of time, I did it on a weekly basis. Uh, what's the past 14 weeks range, which as you can see here, is representative of only about 3.9% uh, of current price. Put that into context. Uh, the last time we saw 14 weeks uh, this quiet, or this narrow, uh, how far back do we have to go? We have to go all the way back to 1994. That is a remarkably uh, quiet period. And uh, I think quiet is a polite word for a complacent is a more appropriate word. These are very complacent markets, and we have to be mindful of what they represent. And I look at the overview. I, I took time to go over the overview of just an appreciation of the exposure of the markets and the change of capital and some of the milestones that are going to be very important through the end of the year uh, for the strategy video. And I'll do these pretty, uh, pretty regularly, not every day, maybe not even every week, but uh, I will keep giving the big picture evaluation of exposure all right but this is definitely a market that is very exposed whether we're looking at it from the high S&P 500 perspective whether we look at it from the fact that we are just uh, using exceptional amounts of leverage all right there are lots of metrics to suggest that these markets are exposed they're not making the kind of returns that uh, would insinuate the price that people are paying and uh, they're not really uh, accounting for the uncertainties ahead that doesn't mean that it has to force people from their trades uh, obviously they can sit through it for much longer than we think is rational but uh, it certainly does not position well for a long risk trade. So I've not, uh, even though I've seen a lot of headlines that suggest there's trillions upon trillions of dollars of uncommitted capital that can be poured into these markets, I don't think that it's necessarily going to uh, be poured into the markets. Not until there's uh, something that significantly alters the underlying uh, fundamental outlook such that we see a robust outlook for growth and return potential or uh, what I think is much more probable there is a massive correction that makes for more attractive prices. So in terms of the risk perspective on the outlier that there is a risk uh, reach uh, or more likely it just sticks to complacency. Uh, something as stretched as, let's say, equities is not going to be at the top of my list. I'm more interested in the carry trade. All right, we've talked about this uh, recently this week. Uh, the carry trade ETF is uh, the, the Deutsche Bank uh, Carry Harvest Index uh, is reaching uh, aggressively to the upside. This is uh, more immediately accessible from the likes of something like an Aussie USD, although be very careful what your expectations are here, and the Kiwi USD potentially uh, you know, stretching even further. But it really is a tough go for risk on. In terms of risk aversion, it's not particularly difficult to spur uh, that kind of sentiment. It might be difficult to, let's say, force the S&P 500 below 20, uh, 215, the SPY, or 2150 on the index. Uh, but uh, the correction of tentative and uh, tentative and, and probably uncharged breaks for the DAX and uh, the Nikkei 225 can lead to quick corrections which motivate some risk aversion. Uh, if that's the case, risk aversion within constraints would be an attractive opportunity. And there are opportunities, especially amongst the uh, the yen crosses. All right, dollar yen is still uh, buoyant within a range over the past three months. 
Um, it, yes, it broke the descending trend channel, but it really hasn't gained any kind of foothold on a, on a fundamental or, or even a, a technical basis. So a correction there is possible. Uh, Euro yen can see a further break below its recent trend line support, although I wouldn't expect that to go too far. The best standing of the risk-oriented uh, opportunities is the Aussie yen. And I talked about this in uh, Thursday evening, Friday morning's uh, trading video. You can see that it's now two days back from the 80 test and rejection. This is one of the best positioned of these risk-oriented uh, low-hanging currencies because one its initial motivation was Aussie employment uh, which has stalled out and uh, provided good reason to retreat uh, but also if it's risk aversion this is a clear move back into a range for Aussie yen and it's not necessitating a break as would be the case with the Euro yen. We'd have to break this trend line to get some kind of uh, meaningful move. For the Aussie yen, we don't really have to get a serious break, although I guess you can say 79 would be a, a noteworthy break, but it moves right back into a comfortable range. And ranges are easier to span than new, uh, blazing new territory. You can make a good case also for the, CAD, uh, the Kiwi yen. CAD yen is uh, less uh, facilitative of that uh, technical boundary. All right, so there are risk-oriented opportunities, but I would still keep them short-term. Uh, if you're looking for a true uh, move towards risk aversion, something that would uh, be, let, let's say, an, uh, the equity index or equities seeing a massive unwind, um, or the like on, a, on an FX basis, it's something that I think really deserves uh, ample time so that we can establish conviction. Being a little bit late to that kind of big picture call is probably worth it. All right, to get that kind of conviction, uh, it's worth the premium to pay, because too many false starts can be quite costly. All right, so risk trends and dollar movement are uh, still two considerable opportunities, but I think expectations are perhaps set a little bit too high for what's actually out there. I did run a poll again, uh, and I noted the poll that I had previously run back in September. Let me pull, uh, there we go. Back in September, I ran a poll asking uh, traders uh, what they thought the time frame was uh, for the next major market correction. I consider a major market correction a 20% uh, move or more. Uh, and back then it was uh, within a single month. And then the second most uh, popular option was uh, within two to three months. Well, September came and gone and we hit the, the month-long milestone and obviously we didn't get a 20% correction. We just got more of that complacency. So I asked the poll again and once again we get the preferred expectation of a 20 percent plus correction within a single month. Now be mindful of this, this is what uh, professional traders in the options market take advantage of. Uh, there is a uh, an overzealous uh, premium given to near-term risk expectations. But we need to be practical in our forecasts and track out reasonable expectations. This is some really remarkable congestion. Uh, we might get a correction, but uh, think about what a 20% correction would entail. It would be quite difficult to motivate. Although it's not like we're lacking for possible catalysts. Uh, the this is this line that I have, and I, I encourage you to put a line yourself uh, to remind your, uh, to remind yourself. Uh, just keep it in in perspective. Uh, but that's the U.S. election. We have a Fed rate decision. I'm more concerned about the December one. Uh, we have ECB tapering probably by the end of the year, uh, at least announced. Uh, we have the BOE uh, quarterly inflation report and rate decision, which is suspected to offer more easing uh, early November. All right, there are a lot of uh, considerable events still ahead of us that can spark such uh, uncertainty and movement, uh, but still, it's going to be a little bit difficult to get that kind of scale of a move within a month's time. 
All right. Not that I'm, I'd be selling any kind of options on that, though, trying to take advantage of the risk premium. Uh, I did also note on the real-time news feed that uh, there's a big drop-off in net short speculative futures positions on the VIX. Uh, people are trying are not trying to push this to the extreme as much as they have in the past, and there's also a big drop in the actual participation in those products as well futures and ETFs. So in these terms I do think that there is considerable risk potential but uh, I'm not tracking out any kind of uh, particular highlights that can serve as a single source for that kind of risk aversion. Although there are a number of things that I do think uh, require us to keep track of. Fed speak through Monday is my top concern, although Brexit uncertainties are always worthwhile. Uh, Tuesday has ECB uh, President Draghi speaking. We also have BOE Governor Carney speaking and more Fed speak. So a pretty cul uh, cumulative view of monetary policy from some of the most important central banks in the world. Add to that Apple's earnings and that's a pretty uh, comprehensive risk-oriented view for Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday is going to bring uh, a couple uh, or more uh, uh, earnings, both UK and uh, US, but the data itself is uh, somewhat lackluster in terms of the scale. Thursday, things get a lot more active. Deutsche Bank earnings, all right, uh, I don't need to say they have been in, in the news, uh, as well as UK GDP. If you think that the Brexit is a concern, really, that we need to watch this as kind of our jumping point to see how the economy is truly being affected before the actual uh, divorce goes through. And then we have, through Friday, uh, U.S. GDP and some European GDP figures, France and Spain. Uh, those are certainly uh, noteworthy and possibly market moving. I, I do think that uh, like with the Fed probabilities that if US GDP were particularly weak it could also undermine risk in a very significant way. Uh, that's kind of the unusual state of the US dollar in the interim uh, changes from risk on to risk aversion. A moderate risk aversion would actually hurt the dollar because its interest rate forecasts would fade more aggressively and there's a lot of premium given to the dollar because of that. But in full-scale risk aversion the dollar becomes a asset of last resort and capital will flow towards it. So if you're looking for other currencies uh, that have potential uh, we do have those Carney speak. We do have the UK GDP. Uh, Brexit itself is going to be a constant uh, uh, talking point. So watch for the pound based crosses. Uh, pound dollar. I think the euro pound will probably serve better as an instrument for uh, the pound. Yes, the euro has been declining a little bit more aggressively, uh, but I do think it's going to level out. The dollar has much more it can actually work with this coming week. So if you want something that's more uniformly pound oriented, this is the area that I would go towards. Uh, do be careful of the pound uh, uh, Kiwi and the pound Aussie and the pound CAD. All, right, all of these have actually seen a correction. And for the bottom pickers out there, which, let's be frank, all of us to some degree are top and bottom pickers. We always look for reversals. Don't be too ze overzealous in trying to pick such a move because they are frequently false har harbingers and they lead to some pretty, uh, pretty upsetting false starts and stop trades. All right, so just be very mindful, very careful. If you do think that the pound is going to stabilize and recover, uh, then these could be uh, some pretty attractive opportunities as well. Some of the Aussie dollar uh, activity will pick up as well. Uh, we do have uh, inflation figures, uh, both export and local consumer inflation. That will definitely feed into the interest rate expectations, which were fueled by the weak employment figure that we had this past week. Uh, the Aussie USD trading within this uh, wedge uh, is definitely going to be an opportunity. So will that Aussie, which I pointed out earlier, uh, We'll also take, a, or I will be watching very closely, a dollar cat. 
All right, massive two-day run, a lot of that having to do with the Canadian dollar itself, which is quite unusual. Uh, but now we're pressuring the upper end of this rising trend channel, and we've uh, started to pressure through a 38.2 fib of this swing high back here in uh, January to the low in May. Uh, that fell right around 30, uh, 33.15. So we are really pressuring the top end of this, but if you want to find the catalyst for a break on this, you need something more. All right. Yes, the dollar can do it, but it's probably going to have to do so through uh, GDP if we want strong follow-through. Uh, or the Canadian dollar, but it doesn't really do have a lot of high-profile event risk. If you want to see dollar cad make a serious break which remember is very difficult to do in these kind of market conditions that's been the contention of why i haven't gotten in a lot of trades that have looked like they were breakout oriented and uh, most of them have actually faltered so i'm happy that i didn't uh, but if you want to see something that has fall through has to have a catalyst one of the most capable catalysts for dollar cad as we've talked about is oil this is oil in, inverted, all right? And if oil were to sink sharply, it could motivate a dollar CAD break to the upside with some degree of follow through. I don't know how much it will you know, take traction of, but it could. Looking at oil specifically, uh, it has stalled at that 5150, 52 level. Uh, that is a neckline and an inverted head and shoulders pattern, I believe. Uh, some would argue with me on that point. Um, but this is a, a possibility because a break below 49, 49.50 would be a move generally back into a range, uh, which would be more comfortable if it's... If it happens violently, let's say under the auspices of, a, of an OPEC uh, uh, mutiny uh, for their cap promises, then yes, that could be perhaps enough to motivate dollar CAD to break to the upside with follow through. More likely than not though, it's probably going to remain relatively stable, and stable means move back into range. And just like the Aussie Yen, dollar CAD back into a range has plenty to work with. So I will be keeping uh, tabs on this one. There's a lot going on in the docket over the next week, and a lot of uh, individual currencies will have specific interest in the items that are on the docket. Uh, we will see thematic uh, development in terms of rate expectations for the Fed, risk trends, uh, and the like, uh, but do still keep it in context of what is reasonable, what is probable, because it's always a probability game in trading. All right. We'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of the markets next week. Until then, I hope you have a great weekend, and I wish you good luck trading out there.